Good morning and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Sandra Kehoe with x -Rite Photo and Video and I want to welcome you all to today's webinar. As many of you uh, may be aware, our audio failed uh, on November 10th, which was the original broadcast date for this webinar. So I'd like to uh, very quickly introduce you to our host, X-Rite Colorado and professional photographer, Michael Clark. Michael is the author of the book, A Professional Photographer's Workflow, using Adobe Lightroom and Photoshop. And Michael uh, is delighted to join us here today. And Michael, I'm handing the reins over to you. Thank you, Sandra. Um, thank you for everyone for coming back. Uh, is the sound okay there, Sandra? Yep, you're coming in loud and clear, thank you. Excellent. Uh, my apologies again, we had sound issues the last time we tried this, but uh, hopefully it all goes smoothly today. So I'm here today to talk to you about a digital, you know, professional photographer's workflow. This ebook I wrote is a 500 page ebook that goes through everything from setting up the camera to color management in crazy detail. Um, part of the book talks about working up images in Lightroom and Photoshop, and then it also talks about making fine art prints and then all um, storage and backing up your images and kind of the, the end part of the workflow for a photographer. Um, so we're going to kind of walk through as much of that as we can today. Um, part of that will be color management. Part of it will be um, actually showing you how I work up an image in Lightroom and Photoshop and then also discussing fine art prints and storage and backup just a few minutes here and there. So going to starting off, um, I was my first introduction to Lightroom was shooting for Adobe before Lightroom even came out. So in 2006, I did an assignment for Adobe when Lightroom was codenamed Shadowlands before it was introduced and shot mountain biking for them so that they could demonstrate the software. Um, and through that assignment, I had to actually work up 200 images in the software and had the chance to sit down with the engineers so they could show me how Lightroom worked which was a huge thing because I didn't know anybody else at that point that's ever been taught how to use the software from the engineers who designed it. So out of that session, out of working with Adobe, I'm also a beta tester for Adobe for Lightroom and Photoshop. I decided to write this book 10 years ago. It's now in its seventh edition. Um, and, you know, for me throughout my career, I've had difficulty getting accurate color. You know, I've my images are printed in magazines, on the web, you know, billboards, and all kinds of different usage uses in books. And I've had a few instances where the color didn't go so well, and that really made me sit up and pay attention to my color management, so that at least on my end, I could make sure that when an image leaves my office, it looks as good as it possibly can, and it will print well. Um, so, without further ado, I'm going to scroll down in this book to the table of contents and go straight to the color management section. And here in this book, I'm actually going to pull up a different screenshot real quick here, um, just so you can see. Let's go to full screen on this one. So just so you can see the difference in color space, because this is kind of a crucial item here. Um, when you shoot your you know, images, you might be shooting an sRGB in your camera. You might be shooting an Adobe RGB. It depends on how you have your camera set up. But these different color spaces will just show you the reality of what we're dealing with in terms of the color. So the prismatic color in the background of these graphs is what we can see in the visible spectrum. Um, the triangles with the little D65 and D50 pinpoints show you how much of what I, we can actually see is contained within that color space. So um, first off is most monitors are sRGB monitors. Um, so if you're working on a laptop or on a computer, that you know, just a normal monitor, you're only seeing what's contained in that far right diagram, the sRGB one. If you're, you have an Adobe RGB monitor, which are fairly rare, then you're able to see all of the colors or a good chunk of the colors that your camera is actually creating, um, which is pretty critical. Um, so going back to the book here, uh, let me put that away. The critical thing, you know, the first thing to think about is the monitor. Um, and which monitor you have here I'm in the book. I'm listing the several monitors from ISO and NEC as well. I think they're PA series monitors are the top end monitors in my mind. 
um, that allow you to see all the colors you're working with. So let's say you know, you're know you shooting in Adobe RGB, but you're working on an sRGB monitor. That means you can't see half the colors you're working with. And in Lightroom and Photoshop, you know, we're moving sliders to adjust colors on our monitor. And if our monitors aren't calibrated and profiled to show us accurate color, um, and if the monitor itself can't actually show accurate color, then that's a huge deal because you don't really know what's going on with the color in your images. I had several instances where, you know, I, was, I used to have an Apple Cinema Display, which is a monitor that a lot of photographers used. And, you know, I pulled up, I worked up the image on my monitor, I sent it off to the magazine, and it looked fine on my monitor. And then when I saw it in the magazine, it had a giant green color cast that printed with the image. And at first, I assumed that it was the, you know, offset press guys that messed it up. But then at some point, a few years later, I bought a ISO, one of these expensive, I think it was the ISO 243W. It's a $2,500 monitor, and trust me, I didn't want to pay that much for a monitor. But when I opened up that same image, I could actually see the green color cast big as day. So I just couldn't see it on my sRGB Apple monitor. But once I got one of the full Adobe RGB gamut monitors, I could see everything. Um, so that was a huge deal. And if you know, I know for most of you, you buying an expensive monitor, there's some in here that go down as you know 826, which is actually cheaper than the Apple monitors out there and they're much more color accurate. Um, so buying a new monitor may or may not be in your purview at the moment, but if you're really into having you know, exact colors or if you do a lot of printing on an inkjet printer or anywhere else, I just the monitor can save you a lot of money because they, these Adobe RGB monitors will show you colors that you can't see on any other monitors. And I know there's probably some other, other monitors out there like uh, I think Dell even makes a monitor that says it can show most of the Adobe RGB color space. I don't, I haven't seen that monitor or worked with it, so I don't know. But these ISO and ANCs are the two monitors that most professionals acknowledge are the top end monitors out there. Um, so just to let you know, because that's not something you hear very often when people start talking about color management. Um, the other thing is that there's the whole, there's a whole lot more to actually calibrating your color and profiling your monitor than just using, you know, a color management device like the X-Rite i1 Display Pro or the i1 Pro, which is the one I have here today. A big part of it is your workspace, and you can see here on this in the book, there's a picture of my office, and you can kind of get a feeling for how geeky I am in that I painted my office 18% gray, and I bought this fancy paint that was exactly 18% gray. Um, there's my ISO monitor sitting on the desk, and I was making a print. Um, so the lighting in your office, if you have walls that aren't white or they're, if they have a tint to them or something, that can affect how the light is reflected onto your monitor. That can affect how you see color. If you're wearing a shirt that's bright purple or you know neon green or whatever color it is, but it's that could reflect on your monitor as well. So it depends on how crazy you want to get about this, but it also depends on your monitor and how reflective it is. Um, you notice that I also have a hood on my monitor there so that stray light isn't reflected on the monitor. The other thing is the lighting in your office should be dim. It shouldn't be pitch black or wherever you're working up your images. It shouldn't be pitch black. I have these Solux light bulbs that I talk about in the book that are um, daylight 5,500 degrees Kelvin or I think they're 5,000 degrees Kelvin. So they're the most accurate bulbs out there that you can get. Um, that is lighting up the office, and I talk about exactly in the book how to make the brightness right at your monitor the, the, you know, the perfect brightness. Because one of the things we're going to talk about here when you calibrate your monitor, and here it goes through some of the options here, the three things we're going to talk about are luminance, gamma, and white point. And luminance is how bright your monitor is. The gamma is the contrast ratios of the monitor, which is super easy because it's 2.2 for all of us. And then the white point is the color temperature of the monitor. So um, the luminance, how bright you make your monitor, depends on the brightness of the room you're working in. So if the room has brighter light, you need to make your monitor brighter. If your room is darker, you need to make it you know, darken down your monitor more. 
So how do you know what brightness to set on your monitor? How do you know what white point to use? These are the two variables that are very critical. Um, so through this book and in this chapter, this is information I haven't really seen anywhere. I started asking these questions early on and you know, it was a big deal to figure out how bright it is because when I'm adjusting brightness of my images in Lightroom, if my monitor is set really far too bright or if you have your monitor cranked up all the way in terms of brightness, then when you print that image, it's going to look really dark. And that's a huge issue. So I talked to a bunch of Offset Press folks who actually know a lot about this stuff and they helped me figure out how to dial in the brightness of the room and then also the brightness of the monitor. Um, Got a question here, Astrid asks, if sRGB has the least scope of color space, why do publishers like Blurb want JPEGs in that color space? That's an excellent question. Uh, Blurb and other people, so if you go to Walgreens or any of these places and print your images, um, they basically you know, are looking for the least possible issues to go wrong. So if they, you give them sRGB, there's less of a chance of your images printing poorly is typically what it is because they assume that 99% of people out there don't have calibrated and profiled monitors and if you've never changed your camera from the basic settings then it's still an sRGB as well so typically that's why people ask for sRGB for at these print houses just because less can go wrong um, but if you want to get the most colors out of your camera and the best Im or best image quality out of your camera then you probably have it set to Adobe RGB Another question about the Retina display monitor, or the Retina, <clears throat> excuse me, the Retina monitors in Apple. Um, they're beautiful monitors. I'm looking at one right now on my laptop, and you know they're amazing, but they're still sRGB or don't even show all of the sRGB color space. Um, also, if you put a black and white image in the four corners of the image and looked at it, it might be darker up in this corner, it might be lighter over here, it might be cyan over here, they're not color accurate from edge to edge. Um, and that's the big deal, that's the reason you buy an ISO or you buy you know, an NEC, one of these Adobe RGB monitors, because you can actually see all your colors. So it's not to say that the Apple monitors are bad, it's just that they're not up to par for really high-end color management. So in terms of calibrating the book I'll show goes through the color monkey and the i1 display pro and shows um, all of these how it works with the screens you know working with the, the devices to actually calibrate your monitor um, the tree and we'll go through that here in just a second um, what I'm going to talk about though for a second is so you've set your brightness and you've set your color temperature typically for my office I've found that 120 candelas per meter squared, which is the brightness setting in the software, is perfect for the lighting I have. And I also work in D65 or 6500 degrees Kelvin and 5500 degrees Kelvin are the two color temperatures I use. When I print my images here in the office or if I'm preparing images for being printed in a book or a magazine, I use 5500 degrees Kelvin for the color temperature of my monitor. Um, for the internet, it's 6500 or D65, which is your monitors typically come at D65. Um, and there's a question Eduardo asks about, good morning, we can expand the gamma 2.2 across the board or 1.8 for Mac computers. It's 2. Point, it used to be 1.8 for Mac several years ago, and then Mac standardized on 2.2, like the PCs as well. So pretty much for the most part, unless you're doing something really um, intensive or suited to your office, I would say just set the gamut at 2.2. And I'd say, you know, when you turn on the software, um, that 2.2 for the gamma, a brightness of 110 to 120 degree uh, candelas per meter squared, and a color temperature of D65 is probably the default to go with. And then basically once you've calibrated and profiled your monitor, um, you'll see here on the left, um, there's a picture of my monitor next to a light viewing box. I basically put a white piece of paper of whatever printer or paper I'm printing on and typically if I'm you know preparing images for a magazine or some book I'll use like Epson semi matte proofing paper which you'll see notated up here um, and I'll compare that white sheet of paper with nothing on it to a white sheet of paper on my monitor and if the monitor is you know brighter or darker than the white sheet of paper that means I need to adjust my brightness if the 
paper on my monitor looks warmer or cooler than the white sheet of paper in my viewing box because the viewing box is um, calibrated to daylight 5500 or 5000 degrees Kelvin so it's very accurate. If the paper looks warmer or cooler then that means I need to adjust my color temperature. So when you're actually calibrating and profiling your monitor you're not done once you just do that initial calibration, you might need to change it and tweak it so that you're matching the color of paper white that you're working with. Um, and I know that's kind of crazy to think about because you could be working with a whole truckload of different papers or you may not even know what somebody's going to, what paper they're going to print it on. But you can at least get a little bit closer than you are. And if you're sending out your images to be printed on the semi matte commercial proofing paper from Epson or the Canon proofing paper that they make, are really good kind of generic papers that look a lot like other papers that printers print on. Um, or you can ask the printer to send you a, a sample of that paper as well. So just to give you, you know, a little insight there into how that works. I also talk about printers here. And down here I talk about how do you know that your, you know, your profile is actually accurate. You can download this uh, color evaluation image from on-site photo. I think it's on-site, S-I-G-H-T, dot com. And you can make a print on your printer in your office, you know, as long as you have the right printer settings. And then you see, you know, you put that print into a light viewing box or under an accurate bulb and compare that to your monitor to make sure it matches. And that's the confirmation that your color management is actually working. Um, so if you can make a print in your office that matches your monitor, then when I send out an image to a client, I'm pretty sure that if I can make a good print of it in my office, that they should be able to get the image to reproduce really well, even if they're converting it to CMYK. So after all that, if there's any questions actually during this, I'm watching the questions in the chat room over here, and um, I'll answer them as they come up. Um, if there's something I'm going to talk about a little bit later in the presentation, I'll defer you to that, but we'll keep moving along here. Good questions, by the way. So let's actually do a calibration, and I'm going to not do the entire thing just because that would take a lot longer than we have. Um, so when you open up i1 Profiler, you'll notice that you have your options here on the left. You have basic and advanced here. You can see that I'm using my i1 Pro. And I'm going to choose, let's just do basic really quick. So here I can choose the white point, and it's set to D65 right now. Oops, I just changed it accidentally, but D65. I have all these options, you know, 100 candelas, 120. For me, I'm going to choose 100 candelas per meter squared. Response curve is standard, gamma is 2.2. So that's it, easy peasy. All I have to do is click the next arrow come over here and I have the device click or connected to the computer, hit calibrate, it goes about calibrating to the device. And once it gets done calibrating, it'll give me the option to go choose the colors that will be used. So it's already done calibrating. So here I can give it a profile name. Or wait a second, something didn't happen back there. Calibrate, yep. Oh, there we go. Then it came up with the patches of colors. So in the basic mode, it gives you a set number of colors. Um, in the advanced mode, you can actually go in and select different size groups. Um, let's actually go back to the advanced mode. And we will go home here. Just so you can see, if I choose advanced, it gives you a lot more options. I'll hit profiling here. And... I can choose the same thing, D65, 120, you'll notice that there's also D55 there, so those are the two that I use. So D65, it's the same thing, 2.2, native contrast ratio. I typically don't measure and adjust for flare or adjust profile based on the ambient light because all the windows in my office are blocked out. I have very consistent lighting, so the lighting is not going to change here in my office. Um, and then I use the defaults here for the profile settings, and I can choose here small, medium, large. You know, so large is using 462 colors, small is using 118, and medium somewhere in the 211. Um, you know, I typically do large or medium, depending on how fast I want to do it. 
just so you know that if you choose medium or large, it's going to take significantly longer. You know, for lar for medium, I think it's twice as long. For large, it's four times as long as the the basic set. So just so you get an idea. And then basically, you you know calibrate your device, you put it over your monitor, and the colors run through. I won't uh, actually do that process because that will take 10 minutes. Um, you know, but I just if I start the measurement. It basically tells me to put the device over my monitor, and then it starts running colors basically over the monitor. Um, it didn't go do at that time because I don't have the device on the monitor, but you get the idea of it. So you know this is something that you have to do. I do it every two weeks. You know I'd say at a minimum once every two months at a very minimum. Um, typically I'd say once every month to keep your monitor calibrated and to keep everything you know tuned up. LCD monitors these days, or LED monitors as well, don't tend to drift as much as CRT monitors did back in the day. But still, you know, before every assignment that I'm working up, or every couple of weeks, I'll calibrate my monitors so that I know I have accurate color. So if there's any questions about calibrating the monitor or anything like that, um, gamma is kind of confusing to explain. Um, we just had a question from... Martha asking about gamma. Let me go back to the explanation here in the book just so you can see it, uh, wherever that was. It's the ratio, and I don't technically know exactly how the gamma works, but it's how it's coded to quantify contrast on your monitor. So, and it's also the midpoint of gray. Um, so maybe we can do a little research on that and get back to you guys, but. Um, so let's move on and actually work up an image. If there's any other questions, I'll answer those as we're going along here. So now we've got a calibrated monitor. I'm going to work up an image here in Lightroom. If it loads here, come on Lightroom. Hello. All right. I don't know why it's not working for me here. Let's see. What's the deal? I have not yet upgraded Lightroom on my computer to the latest 6.3, um, but hopefully it works for us. Here, let me just force quit Lightroom and reopen it real quick. Um, make sure that everything's working there. Choose the catalog. I don't know why it's why is it doing this. Use default catalog. Let's see, and there's no images. What is the deal? Let me open the recent catalog. Sorry about this. I don't know why it decided to not work on me right there. Let me open up the catalog and go find it here. It's in my pictures folder. X ray catalog. And here we go. This should open it back up again. So my apologies about that. Um, I have a bunch of software open for a presentation. It didn't seem to go well there. So let's look at the images here. And I've got a few images that I was going to work up. Here is the image as it was processed earlier. This is how it started out right here. So I'm going to go into the develop module and work up this image. Uh, first thing I'm going to do in develop module, um, and there is a question coming in, any specific considerations for profiling canvas? Depends on the canvas. Um, it's more an issue of color gamuts and what it can reproduce um, in matching paper white to that canvas. Typically it's not too hard. Um, you don't profile your monitor any differently. You would probably use the D55 or 5500 degrees Kelvin color temperature. Um, when you're printing on an inkjet printer. And then, you know, see how it prints. It would have more to do with the rendering intents that you use when printing, either perceptual or uh, relative color metric. Um, so typically, I don't print on a canvas that often, so I don't fully know, but I know a lot of people that do, and it, there's not huge differences printing on canvas than there is printing on, you know, a semi-gloss paper. 
Uh, another question, uh, Michael asks, is there any difference in monitor calibration if intended output is CMYK or RGB? So here's a very good question. If you are working up images and they're going into the CMYK color space, that, which is telling me a couple different things, then you definitely want to be having your monitor calibrated to D55 or D50, so 5,500 degrees Kelvin or 5,000 degrees Kelvin, so because that's going to an offset press probably, or 90% of the time I'd say. That's, those are the people that are working in CMYK. The other thing I would really highly suggest is that you talk to the printer and see what their settings are so that you can match those when you calibrate your monitor um, and they will be able to guide you through all of that. So um, another question, Russ asks, what do you have the monitor set at before you start the calibration process? Um, for my ISO monitors, it doesn't really matter because these days actually the monitor calibration device is taking over control of your monitor and the brightness and everything. So it's going to take whatever it sees and force it to look, um, act, force it into showing accurate colors and at a certain brightness. If you have a really older monitor, then you might have to actually manually adjust your brightness of your monitor. But if you have a monitor from the last four to five years, that's usually not the case. Um, if you were, here's another question Jerry asks, if you work in black and white, do you need to calibrate? Um, there is no profile for black and white, and yes, you need to calibrate. Black and white is actually much trickier than color in many ways. Um, because you're not seeing the color, and the other key with black and white is you really need, if you're going to do really high-end color work or you know, work on black and white images, that's where you really, really want one of those higher-end monitors that shows all the tones because it's going to have not only accurate color, but it has accurate brightness across the monitor. So if you're working on a black and white image and it's darker in one corner of your monitor than it is in the middle, that's going to change the way you work up the image and you might end up printing it, and then it doesn't look like your monitor. You're like, why is it darker or lighter in that corner when I don't see it that way in your monitor? And that's the limitations of the monitor you're working on. Um, Thomas also asked in advanced mode on the Dell here. There are options to like native or RGB or sRGB. I typically just use the native setting um, because that uses a contrast ratio that's built into the monitor. Um, You'd have to experiment and see which ones work better for you, but I, I'm pretty sure the native is probably going to be the way to go there, Thomas. So uh, without further ado, let's jump into working up an image here. Um, so this image, I reset it back to how it was worked up. And you know, in the Lightroom develop module here, basically I start from the top and work down. We have our histogram at the top. One thing to note, um, when you're working up images, typically you know, you come into develop module and stuff, you know, everything looks like this, where everything's smaller, you know. First thing I do is I take this side here and I pull this all the way out um, and click off these corners at the top and the bottom and everything so I can see the image as big as possible and by pulling out this right hand panel it makes all of these sliders less jumpy and more sensitive so I can make more accurate adjustments. Um, coming back to questions here, Marsha asks, my ISO self-calibrates. Is this enough, or should I also use my iWin display profiler on it? Um, if it's self-calibrating, it's probably really good. I know those new ISO monitors have a little pop-up thing. Um, you can use the iWin profiler with that as well if you want. Um, you can try either one. The, use the ISO calibration and see how it goes. Then try your, your i1 device if you have one and see if which one looks better um, or make prints out from both both calibrations and see which one works better and then go with whichever one seems to be best. Uh, my guess is they're probably going to be fairly close having an ISO monitor myself. So uh, first thing I'm going to do, I usually skip the white balance and back to our processing here. Skip the white balance um, because everything I do down here is actually going to affect the white balance. So um, first, you know, this was a flash. I, this image was shot with flash. So I'm just going to pull the exposure up ever so slightly. I typically don't adjust the contrast here because I'll do it down here in the tone curve later. I might just open up these so we see a little bit more of the shadows and the highlights. Whites, I hold down the option key and you know there's some chrome on that bike so I'm not really worried about this stuff blowing out. That probably should be blown out. 
Um, the blacks, I'm going to pull those back from the edge so that there's no blacks clipping. Um, so that's my initial starting point. By hitting the backslash key, I can actually see, well, let me go back and assign this guy uh, to the beginning. Reset settings, control, create history snapshot. All right. So now when I hit the backslash, backslash, backslash key, sorry, you can see where I started and where I am at right now. So that's where I was at. This is where I'm at right now. Um, clarity, I tend to add a little clarity to just about everything. I'm going to pump the vibrance back up because those leaves were super intense that day. Um, coming down here to the tone curve, I usually just add a little bit of an S curve to the tone curve to add just a little bit of mid-tone contrast here. So I usually like plus 10 and negative 5 for lights and darks, something like that. Looks pretty good. I'll come back up to the white balance here. And the way the white balance is slated to work, or at least the, the way the engineer showed me, was that you go to a wild extremes, kind of like a pendulum. And the only way you can actually see a white balance and adjust it is if you compare it to some other white balance. So typically, I go to these extremes, and then while I'm going to those extremes, I see somewhere in here is where it's kind of, you know, right in there somewhere is where it looks accurate. Same thing with the tints. You see it goes from green to magenta. So I'm going to go to those wild extremes, and then I'm going to slowly kind of drop in somewhere in there. looks good. Um, and then I'm going to come back up here, and we go back to as shot. I'm going to see what those numbers are, what it looks like as shot. It's a little warmer. And I go back to my custom setting, which is a little bit cooler. And I actually kind of prefer the warmer look that it had. So I might boost this up just a little bit. And please note that my monitor is calibrated, so we're on a webinar. If you're watching this, the colors may not look the way I have them intended. Um, I have this monitor set for D65, 2.2 gamma, 120 uh, candelas per meter squared. So if, if this looks odd to you, it might be a matter of the calibration on your monitor or the way it's being projected in the webinar. Um, so moving on down, I'm not going to touch any of these other guys. Um, sharpening, it doesn't need any sharpening or noise reduction. I shot at ISO 200. Um, I do always click the remove chromatic aberration here. Um, and then I do select a profile for my camera. It was shot with a Nikon D4, I believe, um, and a 7200 2.8 lens. I'm going to actually remove the distortion because I want it to look the way it looks through the camera. And I might actually leave some of the vignetting just because I like vignetting. Um, coming back down here to the post crop vignetting, I actually am going to add some vignetting to this image. I'm going to go fairly strong, as you can see here, right off the bat. And then I'm going to back it off. And I'm doing this because I want to push my viewer's eye to my subject really quickly. And you're going to notice here that I am only adding a very slight vignette to this. You wouldn't even notice it if you didn't see me just do that. Um, so that's basically what I would do here in Lightroom. Um, we have another question coming in. Michael asks, if a, using a color checker passport to profile a camera, do you recommend any adjustment to the white balance or rely on profile? Um, if you're doing, there's a couple different ways using a color checker passport. That's a great question. Um, basically, you can you take a picture of the color pa checker passport in the light that you're shooting in, and then you can either grab the eyedropper tool here and go over to you know a gray part of the usually it's not the pure white but it's the gray just off white next to the pure white in the color checker passport it's in the bottom left corner um, just one over from the the pure white and you just select that and that is a custom white um, or custom white balance setting or you can do the whole uh, thing down here in the camera calibration where you actually have Lightroom automatically select the color checker passport and then build a custom white balance or a custom profile from that. Um, both options work well. So if you're doing that, that will give you accurate white balance to the scene. And then once you've done that part of the custom white balance, you can manipulate the white balance to taste. If you want it to be a little warmer or a little cooler than you know the custom white balance created by the color checker passport. Hopefully that answers your question. We don't have time to go through that whole uh, process of how it, how the color checker passport works, but 
just to throw that out there for you. Um, also, I typically do quite a few uh, localized adjustments here, so I might darken this down, and that's pretty extreme right now, but I'd back that off the exposure here. I might even draw one over here. I draw typically quite a few gradients, or graduated filters rather, to help push my viewer or push their eye to the subject quicker. Um, and I want these to be very um, low-key, not obvious. So you can see here, if I click this off, that's how I started before I started adding the graduated filters. Here's what happened after. And after I do that, I might need to open up a few of these sliders just to brighten it back up a little bit. So, you know, this is where we started. This is where we're at. And one of the things about Lightroom, just so you know, is it's using a hybrid ProPhoto color space, uh, ProPhoto RGB color space with an sRGB tone curve. It's called Melissa RGB inside of Adobe, um, but it's not a true ProPhoto color space. So for me, you know, I can set my endpoints fairly close here, but if I really want to dial in my endpoints, I have to go to um, Photoshop, which I'll do right now. And I realize we're covering a ridiculous amount of ground in a very short time, but the ebook goes through this really in crazy detail for everything I've talked about and way more. Um, also, um, we will be giving away five copies of the ebook at the end of this, just so you know. Um, so stay tuned for that. At the end of the screen, there will be a link to a uh, a questionnaire that you can fill out, and then that you'll get a copy of the ebook if you're one of those lucky five people. So we have another question from Michael. Um, under, pro, under the profile tab, there are three choices, auto, custom, and default. What do they do? Um, let's go back to Lightroom real quick. Profile, camera profile. I think that's what he's talking about. You might be seeing different profile options there depending on which camera you use or which image you're looking at. Um, auto, custom, and default. If you're looking at a JPEG, that might be what you see. For my camera, there's the Adobe Standard, and then the, all of these, the Camera Vivid up to the Camera Landscape, are the options within my Nikon cameras. If you shoot Canon or some other camera, you'll see different actual names here. Typically, you see the Adobe Standard, which might be default. It depends on what image you've actually you're actually looking at. Um, and what those are, those are just different starting points for working up your image. So you can choose those others, those other options, and it'll, it'll change the colors of your image, but it's just basically a different starting point. Um, another, Michael said, lens correction, the second tab. So lens corrections, we're going from basic to profile. That's the one I used. I'm not sure if there's a question there or not. Um, but let's go back to Lightroom or Photoshop, just so you can see what I do in Photoshop. Um, I'm not doing a ton of work in Photoshop typically on my images. Basically, I'm doing a levels adjustment here, and I am using the option key to set a very accurate adjustment there, a clipping, and then here I can see, you know, I'm clipping a little bit right there on the pure white. Uh, neck brace that she has on, but it's pure white, so that's okay. So I'm basically saying a really uh, accurate levels adjustment for both the black and the white points here. I also typically use 252 and 3 for the output levels. I do that because my stock agency, Getty, requires that for their images so that they, when they print, they don't print with any pure white showing through the paper white. Um, once I do a levels adjustment, you know, I'll also come back here and adjust the brightness if I need to. I might, anytime you do an extreme levels adjustment, which that definitely is not an extreme levels adjustment I did, you might need to adjust the vibrance as well. But I'll just fine tune the image here a little bit, and it's a very slight difference from here to there that might not even be perceptible on your monitors. But basically, this is stripping just a little bit of a layer off the image to give it a little bit more micro contrast. Um, and that's basically all I do for working up my images. At this point, maybe there's some more retouching I would have to do if it was a portrait or, you know, if there's any dust spots in the images. But that's pretty basic. I'm going for a natural look of how the image looked when I was there on the scene and shot it. 
Um, so let's go back to questions here for just a little bit. Um, Mark asks, why do you wait to apply the Lens profile after you've made the basic adjustments and not before? The profile changes the appearance, and that's an excellent question. Um, I could set up a profile for the lens um, on imports, or I can set up, you know, a develop preset that check by it, I do have one actually that typically when I import images I remove the chromatic aberration when I import the images into Lightroom the raw images um, I don't typically set up enable profile corrections because some of the lenses I have are older and they don't exist here in Lightroom just yet um, I have a bunch of new ones that do obviously but it also depends on the image and I sometimes I take out the distortion sometimes I leave, I pull this all the way back. Sometimes I'm moving the vignetting, so it's, it's image to image on how I deal with that, and that's why I don't do it right at the very beginning. Um, compared to Lightroom, how did you rate Adobe Camera Raw, Steve asks. So Adobe Camera Raw is essentially the exact same color rendering engine as Lightroom. It's just the one built into Bridge and Photoshop. Um, the one good thing about Adobe Camera Raw is you can actually choose the color space you're working in, and that allows you to um, very accurately set your endpoints in Adobe Camera Raw and not have to go to Photoshop like I just did. Um, for me, a Bridge in Adobe Camera Raw is not as fast in terms of editing your images, in terms of figuring out which ones are the best ones that you want to work up. Um, and for me, being able to zoom in to see sharpness at 100% is, you know, a huge part of using Lightroom and one of the major reasons that I use Lightroom these days because I can zip through images really fast and see, you know, which ones I want to work up. Um, so let's continue on. If there's any other questions, oh, here's one more. For printing, do you do corrections on a soft proof? Well, that's a very good question here in Lightroom. I can actually do soft proofing, and this is one of the things a lot of us uh, beta testers asked for for many years is the ability to do that. And I can choose Adobe RGB. And if you see here, you see how the histogram changed when I click soft proofing in Adobe RGB. Now I'm clipping on both sides of the histogram, um, which is why I want to set the um, levels in Photoshop. Um, I can do this, and I can keep working up stuff here and adjust it so that I'm not clipping. It's a little more difficult to do than it looks, actually, as you can see. Um, undo, let's just keep working. Um, so I can't actually do this, but there's things in Photoshop that I can do that I can't do here in the soft proofing. It's good for printing and seeing how it's going to print. If you're gonna, you know, I think I have some other profiles in here for my Epson stylus. Let's say I'm using watercolor paper. I can see how that's going to render on the watercolor paper, and this is a soft proof, so it's kind of an approximation, so don't take that as how it's going to look on the paper. But that's kind of good to know how it might look when it prints on the paper you're printing on. If I choose something else that's more glossy, like let's say gold fiber silk, it won't change nearly as much. You know, I'd probably choose, or do that with relative uh, color metric instead of perceptual. I typically don't print out of Lightroom unless I'm in a rush because I can control the sharpening on the image in Photoshop quite a bit better. So I don't use the soft proofing feature here in Lightroom that often, but it is here just so you know it. Um, let's go back. There's a couple more questions. Um, when I bring an image back into Lightroom from Photoshop, it always looks brighter than when I started. Obvious workflow problem. Um, hard to say, Michelle, on that question. Um, it could be, you know, there's an interesting thing with Lightroom is a very dark interface. Um, you'll notice when we went to Photoshop that I have actually had my, I set mine to a lighter interface. Um, I think in the preferences, you can change the interface from, you know, yours might look like this. Um, it makes a difference on what color your interface is and how it looks, you know, if it's a really dark interface, the image looks brighter. If it's a lighter interface, it doesn't look quite as bright. Um, so that's up to you. It's hard to say to answer that question in a webinar. Um, Jeannie asks, after calibration, when do you go through before and after? How close do you have to be for the gamma D65 and brightness? Um, you know, obviously it depends on if you have a light viewing box or if you have a uh, the 
the light that you're viewing your white piece of paper on to calibrate your monitor. And it's, it's definitely an approximation, you know, how close you get is how good your eyes are and how many times you want to recalibrate to get your match paper white, basically. Um, the trick is make a print, and if the print looks good under the right lighting conditions, accurate lighting conditions like D55 or D5000 in the print viewing box or under a Solux light bulb that's 5000 degrees Kelvin, you know, daylight balanced bulb, then call it good and you're ready to roll. Um, I don't sit there and obsess, you know, recalibrating my monitor 20 times, but I've kind of figured out my numbers for the papers I print on, so I have that dialed in the first time. So you don't really have to do that you know, every time you calibrate and profile your monitor, it's usually just that first go around for the paper you're working with there. So hopefully that answers your, pressure, your question there, Jeannie. Also, Marco has another question for fine art printing through Lightroom. Can you fine tune in Photoshop and print on Lightroom? And the answer is definitely yes. And that is the next thing I wanted to talk about is making fine art prints. Um, back to the book here. I'm gonna go way back or down here to the fine art printing chapter there. So I added a whole new chapter on making prints and obviously you could write a whole book on making fine art prints, um, but just so you guys can see the chapter here, um, you know, one of the things, the first thing we deal with here is why even bother making prints, and that's a big deal these days because most people don't even make prints. I just started making prints in the last four to five years, and I've found that it actually makes me a better photographer. Um, we talk about the cost of printing here. We talk about printer options. We talk about calibrating, you know, your color management and stuff for fine art printing. One of the things I will say is back in Lightroom, they actually added a, in the print module, this is the funniest thing ever, I think, um, they added a slider at the very bottom, print adjustment, so that if your prints are looking darker or brighter than your monitor, you can adjust it here. And the reality is, if you follow the advice I have on dialing in your color management, you should not be using this. If your prints look dar darker or lighter than your monitor, that is a monitor calibration issue, not how the software is interacting. So just so to make that clear, um, going back to the book, so just gonna kind of zoom through this because we only have five or 10 minutes left. Um, talks about choosing papers. There's a whole bunch of things to think about, print permanence, preparing images and how you sharpen them, how you resize them. You know, this is an interesting little tidbit here, how big can you print your images? Um, for 12 megapixel images from my Nikon D700, you know, I can print at 180 pixels per inch on my Epson printers at 24 by 36. That's pushing it to the maximum that I feel comfortable. And this is a matter of taste and how close you are standing to the print. Um, but back to Marco's question here, if you work up the images in Photoshop or fine tune them in Photoshop like I was doing, you know, if I'm in a rush or if I need to make a bunch of prints for the athletes that I'm working with to give to them, I'll probably do that in Lightroom because I can do a whole series of prints and just have the printer spread, spitting out, you know, five to ten different prints through Lightroom. And I'll just open up those TIFF files that I worked up in Photoshop or Photoshop document files, the PSD files or whatever I have that's fully worked up. And I'll just re import those into Lightroom and start printing from there. So it's essentially the same color rendering or printing engine in Lightroom as it is in Photoshop. It's just in Photoshop you have a little bit more control. The one thing I will say about Lightroom is that it does have phenomenal sharpening built into Lightroom. So this print sharpening right here, you know, typically standard, you know, glossy or matte paper depending on what you're printing on, you know, those are excellent printing, so are sharpening methods. And if you don't have a lot of experience sharpening your images for printing, then I would use Lightroom at the beginning because it'll result in some pretty amazing images. And for my Epson printers, typically I print in a resolution of 360 PPI pixels per inch. If you're working with a Canon or HP printer, I would say 300 pixels per inch is the way to go because that's the default of their print heads. Um, and if your images are in 16-bit, I would select 16-bit here in Lightroom. Um, and then you select a profile of whatever paper you're printing on, relative perceptual, I turn that off. So, you know, that's kind of the gist of printing there. There's a lot more involved in printing than just that. Um, but that gives you a little bit of an idea of how I deal with printing. And the book goes into way more um, information than that. 
Uh, let's see, there's also, let's talk about, let me escape out of this PDF for a second. Let's talk about storage uh, and keeping track of your images. This is a huge thing for photographers. Um, dealing with how to back up your images, how to make sure you don't lose stuff. Um, I've lost an entire shoot. I had a mountain biking shoot up in Colorado that I did. It was a week-long shoot. Over 3,000 images from that shoot. Two of my hard drives died within 24 hours and I nearly lost all of my business information for my entire career and that shoot. And luckily I got the business information off. I didn't get the shoot off, but uh, Bike Magazine asked me to send the raw images to them along with the worked up TIFF files, which is very unusual. Typically clients don't ask for that. And so, you know, that was a couple of years before when I, after I shot the that mountain biking shoot that I lost the shoot. So I called Bike Magazine up and they still had the DVD amazingly with my raw image files. So I have the 120 best images from that shoot in raw form. Um, luckily, so I didn't lose everything from the shoot, but that really woke me up. Um, so my whole recommendation on hard drives is to have at least three copies. Two is not really backed up. That means you have an extra copy, but make sure you have a minimum three copies of on three separate hard drives these days. Um, here in my office, let me I'll show you uh, how I my backup strategy is fairly complex, but just so you can get an idea of what it looks like. This is how I back stuff up. In the field, you know, my images go onto these little working hard drives and then they get ingested through this G-Doc, which is just a fancy, fast way of, you know, plopping these drives in to connect them to my computer. And then they go to a live work drive, which is backed up inside of this enclosure. And then once those are worked up, they go to my master or RAID arrays here. So there's two here in the office, so it's backed up. Here's the master one, here's the backup image archive, and then one goes to my safety deposit box at the bank, a copy of that, and then one goes to my parents' house every once in a while in another state. So I'm backed up four times just to be absolutely sure I don't lose anything. Um, I also back up my computer's hard drive just in case the computer decides to like give up the ghost one day, I can start up off this GTEC drive here and keep working. So, you know, I would say this is a very complex backup strategy because I have 72 terabytes of drives in my office. For most people, they don't need that much. Um, so, you know, it's a matter of just making sure you have multiple backups. If you've got two terabytes of images, um, I would just suggest buying three, four terabyte hard drives and making sure everything's the same on those three hard drives, taking one of them and if your images are super important to you, put it you know, at a friend's house or at, a, at the bank in a safety deposit box, somewhere where it's out of your house. So in case something happens to your house or in case there's you know, a flood or something like that, you don't lose everything. And this goes for everything that's important, not just images, um, whatever you need to back up on a hard drive. Because it's not really a matter of if your hard drive's gonna fail, it's a matter of when your hard drive's going to fail. So um, I hope that helps you out just a little bit there. This chapter discusses everything from read write speeds and RAID arrays and all the different options and things you need to think about to back up your images and you can see there's a whole bunch of text here. Um, it also talks about cataloging and alternate workflows using other software like Photo Mechanic or Capture One so it's not completely just about Lightroom in this book. Um, but if there's any other questions, please put them through and I'll do my best to answer those questions. Um, that is pretty much the end of the webinar at this point. I left a little bit of time here to talk about or answer your questions and here's one right now from um, Sandra. Do you use any cloud storage such as Carbonite? And the, qu the answer to that is I do. I actually use Photo Shelter um, and that is uh, it's a website that's cloud storage um, and basically I have my 12,000 best images up there um, so that I can access them from anywhere in the world. Um, I don't use it as a full-time backup because I've got so many images and it's just not fast enough to upload and download images as an actual backup. So cloud storage, you know, could be that 
third or fourth backup, but I would just be careful. Um, there was a company, Digital Railroad, years ago. There was a cloud storage backup site, and they went bankrupt and told their clients, you know, you have 24 hours to get your images off of our site. So there were 10,000 people trying to get, you know, ter gigabytes worth of images off their site, and nobody could get their images off. So be very careful if you're trusting cloud storage right now. In the future, I'm sure it's going to be amazing. Um, Marsha asks, is it a bad idea, bad idea to print borderless on an Epson 3880 printer? The Epson people say it's okay, but other people have told me it will damage the printer. Um, if the Epson people are telling you it's okay, then I don't think it's going to be a big deal. Um, I don't print borderless that often, but I don't see that it's a huge deal. Um, I would call the Epson to help people and ask them. Uh, since they make the printers, they would be the ones to know. Um, Jerry asks, what does a higher PPI result in whoops, um, a smaller max print size? Why does a higher PPI? Because you're basically making more pixels per inch. So in that maximum print size little dialogue I showed, um, 360 is the default uh, pixels per inch for Epson printers. It's 300 for Canon HP. Um, it's basically you're squeezing more pixels in an inch, so that reduces the image size. So for maximum print size, if I print at 180, which is half of 360, or 150, you know, which is half of, half of 300 for the Canon and Epson folks, or Canon and HP folks, um, that allows you to print a little bit bigger image, whether or not 150 or 180 pixels per inch or dots per inch per se looks good to your eye will be up to you, and you'll have to figure out if that works for you. Um, Let's see, a few more questions here. Uh, where'd it go? Let me see, backing up here. Do over, when color correcting, do you go along with the rule to not look at the image more than 60 seconds because your eye will adjust to the colors and will look fine? Um, I have not found that to be true. I've uh, Color correcting, you know, if you're doing white balance, if that's what you're talking about in terms of color correcting, then you need to compare it to a different white balance to really see the differences. You know, really tiny differences in white balance are hard to detect. Major differences are pretty easy. Um, and that also depends on your vision. And if you are colorblind in some ways, so that's something to figure out as well. I don't see that looking at the image longer really affects how I'm doing the color correction. It just makes me fine tune the image a little bit more. Um, do Marcos asked, do you cover print? printing process using a Canon printer in your ebook. Um, there is, I think, in the color management section, it goes through using an Epson and a Canon printer. So, and I think it uses the Canon plugin for the Canon printers as well. So it goes through all of those things and it covers all the basics of whatever you would run into in the print preview dialog as well. Um, Randall asked, could you apply all of the, whoops, sorry, I just disappeared here. Um, let me get, find that question again here, Randall, and I'll answer that. Um, could you apply all of those adjustments globally to, globally to other photos shot at the same time and place? The answer is yes. Often if I, I shoot a lot of sequence, since I'm an adventure sports photographer, I'll usually work up image, one image and then apply it to a bunch of the other images in that same sequence of images. If I've done local adjustments to all those images, I might have to go in and fine tune the local adjustments. but that works excellent. Um, Terry asks, when editing in ProPhoto 16-bit and sending the color space and the bit depth to the printer, what do you do regarding printer DR versus ProPhoto DR? So typically when I'm printing, I print my images from the Adobe RGB color space. Um, the Epson and Canon printers, you know, their top-end printers these days can actually print a good chunk of the Adobe RGB color space, maybe even just a hair more than that. Um, if you're printing from ProPhoto, it's a little trickier with the color management, um, so that's why I print with Adobe RGB, because less can go wrong. Um, I, since I don't have experience dealing with ProPhoto and printing from there directly, um, I don't know if I can answer your question. I would be, one thing I will say is don't ever send anybody a ProPhoto RGB image because they may not know what to do with it, and there's no monitor that can actually display all the colors from ProPhoto RGB. Um, so Don asks here, how do you keep track in Lightroom of which disk an image is on, when that disk is 
detach from the computer. I have multiple hard drives with Lightroom images on them. My laptop cannot be connected to all of them, of course. Well, the beauty of Lightroom is you keep those images on whichever hard drive they're on, and when you import them, it references that hard drive, and it'll actually tell you with the hard drives attached or not. Um, so Lightroom is great. You just uh, let me pull Lightroom back up here, um, and let's go to the library here. You can see this one's on my Macintosh hard drive. If I had, you know, other images here and I don't have my hard drives attached to my to my computer right now for the webinar, there would be another one with whatever the name of those other hard drives were. And even if it's not attached, it'll still show the images in there. Um, so I hope that answers your question. I know we also had one at the very beginning. Um, Marco asked about, you know, he has images from Lightroom 2 and 3 and he's moving up to Lightroom CC6. How does he... Um, how does he back up everything on an external hard drive or how does he migrate everything over it? When you update it, should migrate everything over automatically. Um, maybe contact me directly, Marco, and I can answer that in more detail. I don't know exactly what you're asking there. So I think that's it. We can go ahead and wrap up. Um, stay tuned for the questionnaire and I hope you win a couple copies of the book. If you have any other questions about the book, um, send me an email. Um, you can buy it on my website at michaelclarkphoto.com. Uh, there's C-L-A-R-K. There's no E on the end of Clark, so michaelclarkphoto.com. Thank you again for attending, and I hope this was helpful. Oh, also, just to remind folks that you'll get a link to the recording of this broadcast in the next 24 hours. So if you weren't able to watch everything, you'll get the whole link with the whole video. Thanks again. Bye-bye.